The United States plans to evacuate thousands of Americans from Afghanistan over the next few days. President Biden wants the military to focus on getting troops and allies out as safely and quickly as possible. Brian Clark is senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's former special assistant to the chief of naval op operations. Brian, welcome to the program. Thanks, Mimi. It's great to be here. What are the logistics of bringing up to 9,000 people a day out of Afghanistan? What does that look like from a management perspective? Yeah, the challenge is going to be uh, not so much in just the, the number of airplanes you need, because uh, as we've seen, C-17s can carry quite a few people. If you if you think about you know having just four or five hundred people on an airplane, which is certainly feasible, you're only talking about maybe 18 to 20 flights a day out of Afghanistan. Um, and if you're talking about other cargo aircraft or other passenger aircraft, you're looking at in the you know several dozen flights a day. So it's not the flights per se that is the problem. The challenge is getting everyone to the airport, processing everybody, making sure that the right people are getting on the planes. And, and you've got a place for them to go. So it's basically either end of the, the transportation uh, process that, that the management challenge exists. So on that front end in Afghanistan, they have to secure the airport, which they have. But then you've also got to have a way for those folks to get to the airport. Um, you know, and there's checkpoints being established and, and you know, there's somewhat uh, a chaotic situation in the capital. So getting folks to the airport is just uh, a challenge from a transportation standpoint. And then being able to ensure that you've got the right people on the airplanes is the other problem. Um, and then, then once once they leave, then, then where do they go? Because there's, you know, they're, they're going to be coming potentially to the United States. Uh, there's a repatriation process. There's a visa process. There's uh, third party countries that are going to take some of these folks. So there's a management challenge involved in just making sure that you understand where each person is going and what their status is from an immigration standpoint. You know, I wonder, obviously, in addition to the tens of thousands of U.S. citizens, there are estimates of 80,000 Afghan civilians right. that helped us over the course of the past 20 years. Has the U.S. military ever done an evacuation of civilians at that scale before? Uh, not really. Uh, so this would be um, in a short time frame, uh, one of the largest evacuations of this kind. Um, obviously, during the Cold War, there were various you know, lifts, you know, like the Berlin airlift, et cetera. But those are mostly about bringing things in as opposed to taking people out. Um, but uh, non-combatant evacuation operations, or NEOs as we call them, um, generally are not this large. They're in the maybe 10,000 person size, for, size range. Um, so this would be definitely one of the largest ones, if not the largest one ever. Um, and it could take all the way to the 31st. I mean, if you think about it, if you've got 80,000 people that need to leave and we're getting out you know, 9,000 or so a day, you're, you're probably going to take all the way to the 31st to get out 80,000 people or more. Um, so it's going to be a tough uh, you know, go to make sure that you drive this all the way to completion. Brian, what about the cost? What does the budget look like for the evacuation? Well, so um, these, of course, it costs a lot of money to mobilize this sort of effort, uh, sending the 6,000 plus troops into Afghanistan that have been sent there. Uh, that's going to have a, a cost associated with it. So you're, you're looking at potentially in the hundreds of millions of dollars to both deploy the troops that are there now to secure the, the withdrawal and then conduct the withdrawal and process those fo those folks. So it's it could be you know, $100 million or more to be able to uh, complete that operation. Um, and then there's you know costs down the line in terms of how do we get those people into the right places and what's their their status uh, following their, re their their arrival in the United States, for example? How do we assist them in transitioning to become American residents? So NATO, NATO has also been conducting evacuations as well as our European allies. What do we know about the coordination among those groups and the Pentagon? Yeah, so the coordination seems to not have been as tight as it might have been in other NATO operations. Uh, the allies have complained a little bit that there has not been as as close the collaboration here as there was in the offensive operation in, in Afghanistan. Um, so now that the U.S. is withdrawing, uh, it seems like they're, they consulted NATO but didn't really work with NATO to come up with a, a firm plan for how that was going to all happen. So the allies have been all kind of independently pursuing withdrawal of their personnel as well as the citizens or the Afghans that helped them. Um, so they're all pursuing kind of independent actions. Um, there's some collaboration, obviously, but it seems like it's a lot of independent activities happening on the part of the different NATO allies. You know, the president has always said that our goals in Afghanistan have been counterterrorism, not counterinsurgency, right. not nation building. Yeah. What are the Pentagon's options here for future counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan if that becomes necessary? 
Yeah, so they're they're somewhat limited. Um, you know, clearly uh, having people on the ground in Afghanistan continuously uh, affords you this uh, intelligence gathering apparatus that could really help you know give you a sense of you know, what the network is doing and where it might be going. Um, and it's not just having U.S. Uh, personnel on the ground to be able to do that intelligence work. Actually, more importantly, it was about having Afghan uh, citizens or Afghan residents that were willing to provide information to U.S., NATO, and Afghan military forces. And without the U.S. there, that those networks are going to break down probably, so you're not going to have this this network of uh, informants and, and intelligence sources. Um, so folks on the ground, the, the, the information on the ground is probably not going to be there to the same degree. We're going to have to rely to a much greater degree on cyber intelligence, uh, space-based intelligence, um, you know, the occasional third party um, actor that is able to gather intelligence on our behalf. So it's going to be a little harder to understand what's happening on the ground. And then to intervene is going to require air power. Uh, and that's going to be hard given that um, to get to Afghanistan from our bases in the Gulf, you have to go around Iran. So it makes it a very long flight, involves a lot of uh, logistics that are going to add to the cost and, and the challenge of doing this. And it's going to take logistics assets away from the Pacific, where the tyranny of range is very challenging already. Um, so that's going to be a problem. And then the you know the, the other op uh, option is naval options, uh, where you can go from the sea using carrier-based aircraft and fly uh, over Pakistan to get to Afghanistan. Um, that's a lot more uh, feasible. Um, it's just that that'll take ships away from operations over in the Pacific as well, where they're needed to address the China uh, challenge. Finally, Ryan, what other managerial aspects will the Pentagon be following here? What's coming next in the next few days? So the, the focus will be on getting out the uh, the citizens, um, U.S. citizens and Afghanis that are going to be uh, brought out of the country um, and the others that will want to come out of the country. So there's going to be a challenge in terms of how to manage that uh, that immigration process almost. Um, and then there's just the logistical challenge of being able to ensure that you've got sufficient airlift going into and out of the country and the air traffic control. And the biggest challenge is going to be managing that final set of flights. So as you're starting to collapse down your your, your circle of control at the airport, um, that's gonna be the, probably the most challenging time of any withdrawal, is, is that time when you're actually just about ready to leave with all of your forces. Um, how do you collapse down that bubble? How do you ensure that the last remaining you know troops on the ground are not gonna be themselves vulnerable? And it seems like the Taliban has decided to take a you know, wait and see attitude. Uh, and if they just sort of uh, hang back and wait for the US to leave, then that'll be great. Uh, if there's some reason for them to initiate some kind of hostilities, that would be the time to do it. Well, Brian, this is uh, definitely a developing story, so we'll continue to follow it. Thanks so much for being on the program. Thanks, Mimi. It was great to see you.